Ladies and gentlemen, here we sit in another extraordinary time in history, and we get to do this show called Countdown to Eternity. I am incredibly excited. This is James Cadiz. I am here with the great Don Stewart, and oh my goodness, things are going crazy. I've said it again and again and again. You can't make this stuff up. Don, what say you, bro? Well, you know, James, we've had programs, and then there are programs, and there's this one. I think, uh, I think, in in some sense, of all the stories we've done so far on Countdown to Eternity, this one has the most tentacles with respect to last day's Bible prophecy. Obviously, we won't get everything we want to say done during this program, but I think we do need to set the table of what's going on, let the people understand that this just isn't, isn't limited to one country in Asia. This has global impact. And so we need to discuss all of that as much as we can during the time we have. Yes, and I am going to make myself disappear for just a second uh, so that I can, in lieu of my face, bring up this map. It's an important map for people to see. If you look from the time that we are filming right now, this is as of, uh, we are talking Monday evening, all, almost all of Afghanistan is under the control of the Taliban. There are only a few provinces, and I'd have to go back and look, but I think it's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven little regions, little areas that are still what they call contested. But the reality of that is contested means, according to the BBC, they've not been able to confirm full control of the Taliban. My guess is this. My guess is they have it all. And uh, this is significant beyond anything we can possibly imagine. I want our audience to take a good, solid look at this. If you are, by the way, listening to us on radio, I would highly recommend you go to the Calvary Chapel Signal Hill YouTube page and that you watch the video that we are producing of this because this is going to give you a very good picture of what it's looking like right now. Lots of people are suffering. Lots of people are dying. And Joe Biden after announcing today that he is not going to turn back, after announcing today that he did a good job, in essence, with the call and is, in essence, going to never go back on the call and would do it again if he had to, has now gone back to his vacation spot, going back, uh, getting on uh, Marine One, going back to Camp David and spending some time with a little R&R, which is pretty much the description of his presidency. And uh, quite frankly, he's the worst president that we have ever had in U.S. history. He has been somebody who has been anti-God, anti-truth, and anti-everything that is good. And it's very unfortunate because now we are watching Christians in Afghanistan that are being killed at a, just an alarming rate. We are watching people who were sympathizers with the United States uh, in Afghanistan dying left and right. People that were on the payroll of the United States of America for intelligence gathering and for interpretation and things like that. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy, and that's kind of where we stand with this. Yeah, and James, we we were told, too, that they're hoping to get everybody out by the end of August or September 1st. They say they probably can't do that. That's how many people are there in Afghanistan who are assets of the United States of America, who are known assets there. And if we leave, their, their lives are gone. Let's just put it that way. They're not just gone. They're going to be tortured. They're going to be publicly executed. They're going to be humiliated. Their families, everybody, simply because somebody somewhere did not think through this uh, evacuation of the country of Afghanistan. Uh, I was reading one story today. You might have seen it, too. The military had all these suggestions, but Biden thought he knew better. He thought, no, we can get it done. The Taliban won't be a problem. As that famous news conference, what was about eight days ago, he said, no, they're not going to be any problem whatsoever. We're told as little as last Friday, it'll probably be a few months before they even get near Kabul. And then it was just a few hours later, Kabul was, was surrounded by the Taliban. So it's, it's one of these things, James, that, you know, it's a story in flux, in progress. And every day is bringing more heartbreak and more stories that are, are totally, they didn't have to happen. They didn't have to happen this way, but they have, and um, we got to deal with it. And uh, I know you, just like me, we've been reading stories with tears, the, the heartbreak there, oh. people. And um, we've just begun to see this this horror. It's unleashed on this country. And again, I will say this. Uh, President Biden is starkly incompetent. Um, he it's, it's so interesting in his media 
conference, whatever you want to call it, when he went and addressed the nation, he basically said that this was the fault of the previous president, President 45, President Trump. And what's so interesting about making that statement is when you look at the facts behind his incredibly foolish, and forgive me for saying this stupid statement, you realize just how big of a liar that man is. I mean, you go back and you just look at the numbers. Let's just deal with raw numbers. When the president of the United States entered into a unilateral peace talk with uh, the Taliban and with the Afghan government, he was accompanied, of course, by the secretary of state who actually uh, disclosed some of this information. They came to an agreement that there would be a what was akin to a full withdrawal of United States troops from Afghanistan in or around May of 2021. Now, the president started very methodically and carefully, the the previous president started very methodically and carefully removing troops from Afghanistan. Now, let's look at the facts, because when President Trump decided that we were going to remove troops from Afghanistan, there were 14, just over 14,000 troops that were actually in the country, still doing training operations, still doing patrol operations, command operations, and so on and so forth. It was really the Afghan troops that were doing an overwhelming majority of the work. We know that that was taking place. And so when the withdrawal started, when Joe Biden took over office, at the time that he stepped into office, ready for this number? This is crazy, right? 12,000, almost 13,000, almost 13,000 troops had already been successfully withdrawn with the region being completely stable and with the Afghan government being in virtual complete control of the nation. And it had been that way because things kind of remained status quo until Joe Biden decided we're pulling everybody out. And within the course of a few weeks, now Afghanistan is under complete control of the Taliban. And that is nobody's fault except the current president of the United States. He is remarkably incompetent. And my guess is he doesn't even understand the geopolitics associated with the corruption and the destruction that has taken place over the last few weeks. I actually think that he's completely clueless. And I think that uh, much of what he is being told, he doesn't even have the capacity to be able to understand completely everything that's going on. So it's sad that that's the case. Um, and, and I just want to make it very, very clear here that when I'm saying this, I'm saying this because his foreign policy has always been weak. He has never had a real capacity to be able to understand the implications of what's going on with respect to foreign policy. Um, his own people have said that he is confused with respect to these issues. So, um, I really believe that this is under this unraveling that's going on is basically the doing of a very evil. And let me say this, a very demonically inspired man. Yeah. And you know, James, this is one of his Achilles heels. It's always has been. There was a number of comments from, uh, you know, leading foreign policy specialists before the election that said everything he's ever done foreign policy wise was wrong, has been wrong, been wrong headed. But you know what was really interesting in the presidential debates? There were no questions at all on foreign policy, not one. And and that, I think that it was done that way by design, Don. I really do. I think that that was something that they did on purpose. They did that for a reason. It's sad, but that's the reality of it. And the bottom line is this. The bottom line is he has demonstrated his uh, lack of capacity to be even, even able to scratch the surface of these foreign policy issues. And these moderators have blood on their hands as well, because even when they were going in the foreign policy direction, and there were a few times where the president was trying to take it in the direction of foreign policy when the debates were going on, he was completely shut down. And uh, good old Chris Wallace, I, I'll just leave that alone. I really don't want to say much about that guy, but he's not a good man. And uh, that's I got a lot to say even about Fox, but that's a whole different point. Yeah. You know, the, the sad thing is, James, this is the perfect storm of everything that could go wrong is going wrong. Here is a man that said he really couldn't do anything here with respect to uh, because Trump already got him into this. Here's a man that gave something like, what, 100 <coughs> executive orders that overruled basically everything Donald Trump did in, in the last four years. Yet he says his hands were tied with Afghanistan. Uh, I'm, are you kidding me? What are you talking about? Oh, yeah. Yeah. To be able to say that is ridiculous. This is a man who has made it his goal to completely desecrate uh, 
anything that uh, President 45 had to do with anything. He hates Donald Trump, always has. And, well, not always has. He actually used to kiss up to him. But uh, as a president, he's hated him. And this is just a simple him going on a rampage. And he has a constituency to actually kiss up to and so on and so forth. And that's really crazy. But Don, let me ask you this question because we all know this. I don't have to get into the, the implications of the incompetence of Joe Biden with respect to foreign policy. I don't have to get into many of the uh, mishaps that he's had and his inability to particularly understand nations that are in the 1040 window. That's where he's really, really weak. I mean, if he's got an Achilles heel and that Achilles heel is foreign policy, the greatest part of that Achilles heel, the most uh, open and detrimental part of that Achilles heel is going to be the 1040 window. I'm going to just tell you that right now. Uh, but besides that, putting that all aside, a lot of people are asking this question. I spent some time talking about this on Monday. Um, there's been a lot of conversation back and forth about this issue. What are potentially the prophetic implications of this? And I know that people want to hear from you what it is, what you think, what your thoughts are on this, what kind of ideas you have. Uh, and I'm actually very eager to hear what you would have to say about something like this. Okay, first and foremost, it shows the fulfillment of what we don't see in Ezekiel 38, 39, and that is a superpower coming to the aid of Israel, mm, the mm. United States of America. You like that, huh? <laughs> I'm telling you, this is what... <laughs> I was kicking and screaming this today or Monday. <laughs> anyway, Monday. I'm sorry. No. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Uh, one of the things that is conspicuous by its absence in the Ezekiel 38, 39 invasion is the lack of a superpower who can or will come to the aid of Israel. Now, that wasn't true in the last administration. So we surmise that sometime in the future, and now it's right here upon us, there will be an administration who will not only move out of the Middle East, but will show in competence to the degree this is one of the possibilities militarily not because of our great military but because of the leadership there the from the political leadership that won't be able to follow through with any type of response uh to uh an invasion with russia and these other countries so the first and foremost thing here it further indicates that you know the u.s not only getting out of afghanistan iraq um wherever else we've been here uh, basically is showing that we are not a player in last day's Bible prophecy, which again, a year ago, James, if we have done this program, we couldn't say that because we were a huge player in the That's Middle right. East. We were there. Uh, they would have be, been afraid. The Taliban, in fact, a friend of mine, an Iranian who um, works with the underground church there said this, the Taliban would have never tried something like this if Donald Trump were president. If he did a withdrawal, they would make sure that the Taliban could not move in. So that's first and foremost, the first thing. The second thing too, it, uh, it, it's the old domino effect. If we show this incompetence here, James, in the Middle East, uh, what's going to happen? Let's say uh, the real I've got a real worry with China and Taiwan here as something uh -huh. else that might uh -huh. take place. In other words, we're going to be uh, our real fight in the future is going to be in the Pacific. And so uh, if the assets, you know, if, if something happens there, we will have to move whatever military we have in that area, whether we, you know, uh, basically defend Taiwan or not. But what it's doing by doing that, the assets are moved from the Middle East. So what I'm saying is with Europe, the Middle East, I see them going into the Pacific because of China flexing their muscles. So that's number two. But basically what it does in a nutshell, it shows that scripture was right. There's no superpower who can or will intervene on the side of Israel in the last days. Uh, look at this. I mean, who's going to trust us ever again in the future? Who's going to rely on us? Israel now, that's another point, is left out in the cold. What are they thinking to this day? Wow, you know, if they turn their back on Afghanistan like that, the U.S., what are they going to do? Are they going to have our back? You know, when they're telling us not to attack Syria, they're telling us not to attack Iran. Uh, remember, uh, Yair Lapid, the new foreign minister, says we won't. There won't be any surprises. We'll clear everything with you guys. And yet, we've got these ongoing talks with uh, Iranians, with the United States, and with Europeans to try and get some kind of deal together. And they will not let Israel do anything militarily until they. they get some type of deal, that, but they think they're going to get. So basically, Israel's hands are tied here too, James. So they've got all these things to me. Those are the things at the top of my head that come right away that are the huge outcomes of this sort of thing that we see. We knew it was going to happen. We just didn't know it was going to happen so fast, so furious, and so horribly.
Oh, hundred percent. And and if any of you were able to get a map that you can actually take a look at things when you start looking at the region of North Africa and Asia Minor and so on and so forth and the Middle East, it's pretty amazing. And I want you to picture this. Maybe if you're watching this video right now and you have a moment to go grab a map, I would grab a map and I would take a look at this because this is this is pretty amazing. Because when you look at Afghanistan. If you go a little south and you go very west, then you are talking about the Iranian border. And it's interesting because the destabilization of Afghanistan opens up significant possibilities for Iran. I'm going to get I'll get to that in just a second. But I also want to talk about China. You mentioned China. I think China is going to make moves with Hong Kong and Taiwan. I think they're going to I think they're going to they're going to get very aggressive with it. I don't think the British are going to get involved with respect to Hong Kong. We know the agreement that was made as a result of them being a colony of the Brits, but the Brits aren't going to get involved because they want nothing to do with that. They're dealing with all kinds of internal issues that they can't fix right now that are very sil similar to the parliamentary issues that we're seeing in Israel right now. Not quite the same, but very similar. And so um I just, I wouldn't even get started on the whole Boris mess and everything that's going on there, but we'll just leave that be. The interesting thing with China is that I think because they know they have a perfect opportunity, they are going to take advantage of the monumental distraction that Afghanistan is creating, and they're going to go ahead and take possession and ownership of areas that they have always been disputing for quite some time. I think when that happens, I think the global community is going to recognize the veracity of the Chinese Communist Party, and I think they're going to finish what they started, and they are going to start scapegoating China, and thus I think China is going to become remarkably insignificant within the next few years, if not way sooner, if the Lord uh, doesn't, or if the Lord tarries. I'll also say this. I will also say that with the destabilization of Afghanistan, I think the number one thing we'll see happen in Iran right now is the final enrichment of weapons-grade uranium. I think that's going to happen. I think it's going to happen faster than a lot of people think because United States assets are no longer focusing on Iran right now. Iran has no idea or no desire to enter into the JCPOA. They've made that very, very clear. Um, Ibrahim, oh my goodness, don't, don't even get me started on, on this guy. But the, the bottom line is this new Iranian president is making it very clear that he is going to carry out the desires of Khomeini. And it's, it's just going to be a complete, it, listen, this is going to be a complete open door for Iran to enrich uranium. In the meantime, we're going to see marked instability in Turkey because I think that Erdogan is going to take advantage of that. He's going to start poking more holes further south in the Mediterranean. I think the possession of the, um, of the Persian Gulf is going to become a whole lot more of an issue. I think there's going to be a lot more debate over there, especially when we start talking about the borders that exist there. And speaking of borders and coastlines, I also think that Russia is going to take advantage of the situation uh, that's going on in Afghanistan right now to actually put some of their own proxies or even some, some of their own direct troops into Libya so that they can finish off this civil war once and for all and take possession of the northern coast of the Mediterranean. I think by them having possession of the northern coast of the Mediterranean, they weaken any position that the EU might have, any interest over where that southern boot is, of course, where we know where Rome is. And I also think that what's going to end up happening is I think that the southern coast of Turkey is going to be per se, no one's going to admit it, but per se, it's going to be controlled by Putin. The key here is Putin, Putin, Putin. And when we start talking about Beirut specifically, Lebanon and the region that is directly above Israel, we're also seeing destabilization right there because there are several economic variables that are weakening the position of that nation as a legitimate nation. I think Hezbollah is going to come in. And of course, think about it. When we talk about Hezbollah, in Arabic, when we say Hezbollah means the party of God, they are the most powerful, most influential terrorist organization in the world. By the way, they have a decent relationship with the Taliban, believe it or not. People don't, don't understand that, but they have a good relationship with the Taliban. And let's take it a step further. They are indeed, they are the extended arm of Iran in northern uh, Israel. Make no mistake about it. Hamas is also being very, very friendly right now because they all have the same common desires and goals. And then you have the audacity, and I did a video on this yesterday, you have the audacity of the president of the United States to be pressuring Bennett to basically set up, and this is no joke, to set up an, a, an embassy in right in Jerusalem for the Palestinians. 
So all of this is going on. All these distractions are taking place. What happens? The United States of America becomes inconsequential. They want nothing to do with the Middle East. Nobody wants anything to do with the Middle East. Believe it or not, Saudi Arabia is falling asleep because the only thing they're concerned about is developing a normalization agreement with all of the UAE as it relates to Israel because they know Israel is their only chance to get defense from the north. They know that. They, they're fully aware of it. Jordan's going to keep out of it. Egypt's going to keep out of it. But that's something that we know. And then when Ezekiel chapter 38 begins to happen, it's going to be in a perfect place. Why? Because Putin is going to come into the picture, or Gog, it might not be Putin himself, he's going to come into the picture and say, listen, I'm the only guy that can fix all this international community, let me go ahead and take care of it, he's going to be the peacemaker, we read about this in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 11, uh, where it basically says we're talking about unfenced cities, we're talking about a time of rest, we're talking about a peaceful time where people are going to be comfortable, they're not going to be concerned, Putin's going to create that element because he's going to tell everybody around him to shut up because he has control over the region, a.k.a. Syria, a.k.a., by the way, the coast of Sudan. They already have a base, a military base that's set up on the coast of Sudan. They are taking over. And we are watching that while all of this is going on and Joe Biden is being a puppet of the enemy and all of this crazy stuff is going on quietly and carefully, Gog is positioning himself to lead Magog and all these other nations against literally against uh, Israel. And here's the thing that's even more exciting for us. I know that isn't happening until after the rapture because God in Ezekiel chapter 39 basically tells everybody, hey, look, here's the deal. I want you to understand this. I am dealing with you, Israel, and I'm going to be the final. You're going to come to know me and no one's going to remove you from that area. Okay, that doesn't sound like prior to the rapture. OK, that is the period where the Gentiles are no longer being dealt with by the Lord. And we go into the time where God is going to be dealing with the Jews. And that is going to be during the tribulation period after the rapture. So what is the prophetic significance? There it is right there. Yes, very good. You took so many words out of my mouth, James. The Mediterranean there with uh, uh, Libya uh, needs to be in control by Turkey and or Russia, that part of the Mediterranean there to, to make to encircle it all because Libya member is the one nation still that's not yet able to put an army together to invade as Ezekiel 38 says so they need, right. they, they need some type of you know unity some type of unified government where they can put an army together that hasn't happened yet it's in process they're going to have poll they're going to have some voting come um this December, it's supposed to have some type of peace treaty. Plus also too, James, I'm sure you're aware of that. There's only two embassies now, which are still functioning in Kabul, and they are the Chinese and the Russian embassies. And, and they're right. guarded by who? The Taliban. <laughs> that's now, right. Surprise, that's right. surprise, surprise. Mm -hmm. huh? You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> <can you? laughs> okay, I mean, bro, you're not, you, you, you're not going to believe this, bro, but we're out of time. Yeah, we only have a couple of minutes. Yeah. We only have a couple of minutes, so I'm giving you the last word as usual because I opened up my big mouth for quite some time. But uh, what say you, bro? As we wrap it up. Well, no, you took the words out of my mouth too, James. What this is, it's it's a global uh, deal here. And when you read the Bible, Daniel tells us in Daniel chapter 12, the wise will understand at the time of the end what's going on because we look at this this whole picture of a globe of all these nations being involved. I mean, from far away to close, the Middle East, the Europe and the such like, and the ones not involved now out of the picture, the United States, we see this, the stage being set in ways, James, when you start thinking about it, that there's so many different pieces. I think I counted one time when I did my book, uh, 25 signs from near the end, something like 25 or 26 different things that have to be in place. Who's in, who's not, who's on this side, who's on that side with all these singular nations. And basically they're all in place right now. Yeah. And so amazing. again, the odds that this would happen by chance are off the board. And so the bottom line gang is that this has tremendous repercussions worldwide. Bible prophecy wise too. And so what we'll be doing in the coming weeks with this program, let me guarantee you, we have just scratched the surface here because oh, this yeah. is like an octopus. The tentacles are going to start spreading out and it will make more sense to everyone. So you really need to pay attention to what we're talking about because this is the Bible, the word of the living God telling us as the Lord Jesus sets the stage for his second coming, what the world's going to be like. And voila, we see it right here, right in front of our eyes. You cannot make this stuff up. Absolutely, bro. And I wish we could talk forever, but we are out of time. And I got to tell you, if there has ever been a time to count down to eternity, it is the time that we are in right now. Bro, I just have to say this. It is such a blessing to be able to do this with you. Uh, I love this time. And I got to tell you, folks, all of you that are watching us, 
We do sincerely hope that you have enjoyed this time as much as we have enjoyed making it. It's been such a blessing. We love you guys. Thank you for counting down to eternity with us. Thank you for being watchers. Thank you for being aware and looking at things. All of the texts, the emails, all of the support. By the way, those of you radio listeners, you have helped us break insane records out there. It has been unbelievable. How many of you have been listening? We've been blown away at the response on YouTube and everywhere else we've been posting, Rumble, everywhere we've been going. It's been amazing to watch God use this. We are so grateful. So on behalf of the great Don Stewart, this is James Cadiz. We want to thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Countdown to Eternity. May God richly bless you. May he keep you and may his face shine upon you. We love you so much. God bless you. Thanks for joining us for Countdown to Eternity with Pastors James Cadiz and Don Stewart. Hear this program by podcast wherever you like to listen to your favorite podcasts and at CountdownToEternity.com. That's Countdown, the number two, Eternity.com. Don Stewart has authored many books on the end times, and you can access them for free at EducatingOurWorld.com. They include 25 signs we are near the end, the final land I Christ, living in the light of eternity. God wants us to know the future and the rapture. Download these books and more for free at educatingourworld.com. Follow James Cadiz on Instagram and Rumble and subscribe to our YouTube channel at Calvary Chapel Signal Hill. If you'd like to stand with us through a donation or have a question or comment you'd like to share with us, again, visit our website at countdowntoeternity.com. That's all for now. But come back next week when we'll hear another prophecy update from James Cadiz and Don Stewart. Countdown to Eternity is listener supported and brought to you by Calvary Chapel Signal Hill.